dancing from Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Welcome to the 11 o'clock worship service of Nutrioso Bible Church. We are here, and we're glad you're here. Uh, we'll start with some announcements, so if you would uh, get the fluorescent orange bulletin that Linda printed this morning that is just shining throughout the sanctuary, turn that over. We'll take a look at the church bulletin board. Um, Let's talk about Bible study this past Tuesday, our very first Bible study after coming back to in-person worship. You know, I've, what, 28 people is what I would like to say was there, but there were 12, and it was tremendous. Did, if you were there, did you like it? Shake your head, yet? Absolutely. Tom is doing a great job talking about the fear of God. Come back Tuesday. You can come early at 1 o'clock, sit in here and meditate or pray and uh, for an hour before Bible study starts at 2, and we'll be letting out at 3 o'clock. Uh, also, uh, we had a great Sunday school this morning. Shake your heads, yes. Did I ever enjoy that? That was tremendous. Uh, Mark Batterson does a great job with this all-in study that uh, Brother Bruce is, is leading. And I just thoroughly enjoyed it. It sparked a lot of conversation. And uh, it's very thought-provoking. So um, do we have any of those books left if, if people are still interested? Okay. Okay. People, if you, if you missed it this morning and want to come, Bruce has the books. And... Um, uh, it's, it's something that is just really uh, appropriate for this day and time. Let's go to prayer requests, unless there's other announcements. Any other announcements? No? All right. Let's go to prayer requests and praises. Uh, John and Kim Goldshot had gone back to Visalia, California for the birth of their first grandchild. Alina Goldshot is still not here. Oh. <laughs> so, but it's getting closer. So, uh, keep them, keep, um, keep uh, the grandparents in your prayers and also the mother and father in your prayers. We will let you know when Alina arrives. Uh, also, um, Monica Blair, Charles and Mary's daughter-in-law. Uh, that surgery was last, yesterday, last night. She had uh, cancer surgery in Mexico at a cancer hospital, and Mary uh, put out a, a notice, uh, an email to that effect, and the surgery went very well, and uh, no complications. So lift her up in prayer, if you would. Also, uh, we don't want to forget Jeremy and Rachel Trujillo. Um, they are still desperately in need of housing. Um, and they, I don't think I mentioned it before, but a lot of us know that they do have uh, a couple dogs. So if you, I mean, uh, I think one of them's a St. Bernard, the other's a Great Day. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, if, two very small dogs. But if, if you come upon a opportunity for them to rent, uh, you know, that is one of the conditions that they, they're subject to is, t is two small dogs. And of course, Lift up their health concerns. Rachel and Jeremy both need prayer um, to get over the infirmities that they are battling with. So, uh, also our missionaries, and I mention this every month or every week, uh, Randy and Rhonda Elliott are still down about $160 a month in support. And Tom and Laura Requat over in Mali, West Africa, are down about $200 a month. Can God resolve that? You bet he can. So lift, please lift them up. Uh, Scott Strim, 
big tall guy that's been with us for a couple weeks now. Uh, he had to leave because his wife Sandy uh, is in the hospital down in the valley and she had cancer surgery uh, and she is recovering from it but definitely needs our prayers. They had to get her down there quickly. Was it yesterday, Tom? Yeah. So remember Sandy Strim and um, Heidi is asking for for prayer. She is asking uh, for prayer regarding patience and understanding and peace. Sorry, got the P wrong. All right. And uh, Ed Davis, I was thinking, remember Ed? Ed Nonita, also known as Nikki, uh, are usually with us several times. His immune system is still, uh, it's still not where it needs to be and is still in the process of rebooting so that he can fight off different things. And that's why they're not with us. I miss, every time I go outside, I, I look over there and see their house and, and just wish that they were there. Um, but they're not. So keep Ed Davis in your prayers. Come on in, folks. We're glad you're here. Hey, Mike, good to see you. Uh, also, a number of our folks are on the road today and uh, need prayers. The Griffiths aren't here. Uh, and also, there are folks in our congregation that are still concerned about COVID-19 and are mitigating that uh, among themselves and with the family. So keep them in prayer also. And they're joining us right now. So we'll say hi to uh, our family members that are still at home. Are there any other prayer requests or praises? Kathy. Hold on, a mic is coming. <laughs> Yeah. Um, oh, I want to ask for prayer for this week. I'm leaving my mom here. She's her new. Oh, that's home right. Yep. Forever, where she'll live out. And um, I just ask for prayer that she loves it and that she is loved and cared for um, every single day. Where did you say that was? In Scottsdale. In Scottsdale, okay. Okay. Any other prayer requests or praises? Or am I? Okay. Mark, Rebecca needs the mic. Um, a while back, we were um, praying for Rob's brother in law with right. cancer. Um, just want to let you know he's. Taken a long time to recover, but he is now able to drive himself to his to get his shots, and he's able to walk up and down his stairs to get to his bedroom now. Oh, that's a big so deal. A yes, big that's a praise. And then a prayer request. Um, Anthony has court tomorrow, so pray that 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 goes the way God wants it to go. Okay. Thanks for sharing that, Pastor Head. Um, Scott, we, we were talking about him a second ago. Right. As he left, he is really wanting the Lord to do some work in his life. This morning, he was in Phoenix with his wife, Sandy. He made a decision, I want to get up there for worship. He came up, he said, Pastor, he said, I'm going to fall asleep. I am so tired right now. Will you forgive me? But he is saying, I want to talk to you this week about Jesus. And so keep Scott in your prayers. He's, he's fought some challenges in his life and the Lord is working with him. So pray for him if you would. Please. Okay. Stacy. Okay, we have two from Facebook. The first one was Ed... Um, they were talking about that he's still having some cardiac issues, which I know you talked about that too. And then um, Kyle White is asking for a prayer request for his wife, Andrea. She's having numbness and tingling in her arms and legs and had an MRI of her spine done this morning. So I pray that it came back normal and that surgery is not needed. Okay. Thank you. Other prayer requests or praises? Mary. 
Hold, hold on just a minute. I'm glad you brought that up. I meant to write that down. Baby Shelby still needs our prayers. He, he is a seven-month-old with uh, meningitis. Uh, he's still in the hospital in, in Colorado. They inserted a feeding tube yesterday because he is not getting enough nutrition. However, he's much improved over what he was last week. That's a praise. Yes. Now, for those of you that don't know, that is John and Sheila's grandson. Am I correct? Their daughter's boy. Okay. Any other prayer requests or praises? No? All right. Brother Lex. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we're able to come into your house and worship you today. We ask your blessing on this congregation and those who are watching this service on video that uh, we will all have our minds opened and our hearts opened to your message. And Lord, we thank you so much for this great day in these mountains. And we ask you to watch these folks in our group who need your help, that you can use your powerful healing hand to reach out and touch them and to support them. Lord, we know that you are all powerful and that this is all an easy task for you. And Lord, we thank you so much for all the blessings of this past week as we go on to the next. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The reading today is Luke 5, 27 through 32, and it's uh, Jesus calls Levi, who becomes Matthew. Later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as a guest of honor. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Jesus answered them, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. So please stand and join us as we come together and sing about Jesus. Yeah. What a wonderful change in my life has been brought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus So joy hold my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. I have ceased from my wandering and going astray since Jesus came into my heart. And my sins which were many are all washed away since 
What a joy o'er my soul, like the sea billows roll, since Jesus came into my heart. I shall go there to dwell in that city I know, since Jesus came into my heart. And I'm happy, so happy, and onward I go, since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, what's a joy o'er my soul, like the sea billows roll, since Jesus came into my heart. Amen. Praise God.
You know, I was thinking the other day about how fortunate I am, and I believe you are, to live in this time period. And I mean that from the standpoint of medicine. Do you realize that there are so many things that if I had contracted just maybe 50, 60 years ago, I would probably not be here right now? But we live in a time when doctors can do a lot of things. And I don't know about you, but I really am thankful for the medical community. Even the COVID that we've just gone through, it would not have been many years ago that we would have helplessly watched as this tore through and just took whoever. And here we are. I remember when I was working in uh, the medical field, when we were working in infectious disease at Fort Detrick, we were told that if we ever got hit with a pandemic, we would be lucky if we would have a vaccine within two years. Lucky. And we're in under a year, and here we are. We're blessed to have good physicians. Amen? Amen. But let's talk about Jesus for a moment. Because in the Bible, there are a lot of very characteristic terms that it uses to describe who and what Jesus is. Think about it. He is the good shepherd. He is the Lamb of God. He is the bread of life. He is those things. But one of the terms that Jesus used for himself that I think really expresses the passion that he had in his ministry was that of physician. Now, if you took a look at the ministry of Jesus, he lived in a time when the religious leaders of his time had non-stop complaints about his ministry. And it usually came down to one aspect. We don't like the people that you're reaching out to. We don't like those people. And you need to reconsider your ministry in terms of get a little better group around you, please. In fact, if you want to see this actually played out in Scripture, Heidi read it, but I'd like to read it with you again in Luke, the fifth chapter, verse 29, it's short, but it's so telling. It says in Luke 5, 29, Levi, who again was later called Matthew, held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. Now the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sick had a complaint. They complained to the disciples, and this was their complaint. Why do you, and by association, your master, eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? That's what bothered them so tremendously. You are drawing people who you shouldn't be associating with. You need to raise your standards, Jesus. And you know what these people were talking about? Was the absolute truth. They weren't spinning false news out there about the people that Jesus seemed to be attracting. This was completely the truth. And if you and I had a time machine right now, and we could say, beam me up, Scotty, to 2,000 years ago, and you and I were to come into a room or out in a field where Jesus was teaching, yeah, there'd be some common, ordinary folks like us out there. There would. But you know who would be in that crowd quite heavily? You might have found some of the ladies of the night, prostitutes. You might have found some tax collectors who were there. And you would have found a lot of people who didn't fit in because they were social outcasts. They had done things. They were not doing things that had isolated them from good people. And you might have also heard the Pharisees and the Sadducees complaining for another reason. Jesus doesn't only associate with these people, but he eats with them, which he says, they're okay. And beyond that too, that Jesus, he touches people when they shouldn't be being touched. Lepers, he'll see lepers and instead of holding himself back and saying, no, 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 he touches them. 
when he has people who are sick, instead of saying, you're getting what God's trying to give you a lesson to teach, he accepts them. He's overruling God. And occasionally we've even seen when a dead body was brought into his presence, what did he do? Any good, righteous Jewish rabbi would never touch that body. But he touches them and raises them to walk. Jesus, let's just get honest with each other. Where is your standard? Why don't you raise it to where we can associate it with you? But you know what's really sad about this? These teachers of the law should have known better. Because if you go back to the Old Testament when the Messiah was being spoken of, over and over it said that this Messiah would be a healer. A healer of the brokenhearted. If you were to look at Isaiah, the 61st chapter, verse 1, he says this specifically. When Messiah came, he would all be about healing. Healing. He would be a physician. Isaiah 61, 1, he has sent me to what? Heal the broken hearted. When Messiah came, when Jesus came, as we were talking in our Bible study, rules are important, but it has to have rules that come from a healed heart. Rules are important if they emanate from somebody who has a real relationship with God. And so Jesus is saying to the person, if you're accusing me of coming into this world to reach out to broken people, you've got it absolutely right. If you're accusing me of trying to help people find forgiveness where they can find no forgiveness, you've got who I am completely right. If you're looking for a Messiah who's coming to give hope to the hopeless, I make no apologies. That's what I'm about. I came to heal. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. I came to transform hearts from brokenness to healing. Now somebody says, Tom, can you prove any of this? And I think the Bible is the best place to go for that, don't you? And I'd like to give you three quick examples this morning that maybe you can relate to personally. And if you've experienced this, praise God, but maybe you can share this with somebody else who really wonders, does this God of yours really care? And does he really want to get involved in my messed up life? I'd like you to think about, first of all, the fellow who threw this party. Thought that'd be a good place to go. Matthew. Now, most of you know about Matthew, but for those of you who don't, I think we really need to look at some things here. Matthew, in his day, was the most hated person in his town. Nobody liked Matthew. You could be rich, you could be poor, you hated Matthew. Matthew was not somebody who got invited to social gatherings. Matthew was somebody who everybody turned their back on, said cruel things about, and why? Because he was a tax collector, correct? And I have to tell you now, I don't really like the IRS. My taxes are in, so I don't have to worry. But I don't really like the IRS, but I don't hate IRS agents. I don't. But people truly hated Matthew. Why? Because the people he was collecting taxes for were who? The Roman government. And at this time, Rome had conquered Israel, had conquered Judah. And to get their tribute, how did they get it? They hired local people who knew the lay of the land, who knew the people, who knew what they had and what they didn't have, how much they could afford, how much they couldn't afford. They hired somebody locally to bring in their tribute, to bring in their taxes. And how do you think those tax collectors were looked upon by the people they served? You're a collaborator. 
You're a traitor, and we hate you for it. Not just because you take our money, but because of who you represent. And you know the sad thing about this? You didn't have to be a tax collector. Rome didn't come in and say, Skip, we understand you know everybody here. You will be our tax collector. In order to be a tax collector, you had to apply for the position. And in many cases, you had to pay for the privilege. And you ask yourself, why in the world would a person not only apply, but pay to have everybody hate them in a community? Why would you do that for your, to yourself? And it's very simple. The money. The money. And the materialism that goes with it, and the lifestyle, and the power. Because you got to hobnob with Rome a little bit. In order to be a tax collector, you had to make a definitive decision that I no longer care what people think about me. I no longer care what my family thinks about me because, again, we talked about it last week, there's close social interaction in the Jewish community. And when the son went wrong, the parents took a lot of mud for it. And so when Matthew applied for this, when he began collecting taxes, not only did the community turn them on him, but his parents, in sheer horror of what their son had done, probably the father ripped his coat and said, you are dead to me. The community said, you are dead to me. And the rabbis would have looked at a person like Matthew and said, you are dead to God. You have become a betrayer of his people. Enjoy your money, because that's all you get in life. Can you imagine that decision, giving up everything that should have meant something to you so that you could have the money, the things, the power? People do that today, correct? They'll throw people under the bus. They'll do all kinds of things just so they can get one step higher up the ladder. And that's what Matthew did. But you know the thing about money and possessions? Their shine only lasts, and their satisfaction only lasts for a little while, because I have personally known people who have made a lot of money, gained a lot of power, had a lot of prestige, and they get up there and they say, is this it? Is this it? When you have sold everybody out, even your good name, and you say, I wish it were different, how can I go back now and become different? But in Matthew's case... There was no opportunity for that because he had betrayed his people. He had turned his back on his family. And so he was a person who was basically doomed for the rest of his life to be that person. That person. A person without a family, a face, a country. Until something wonderful happened a rabbi by the name of Jesus shows up, it appears, at his booth and he doesn't spit at him, he doesn't curse him, he doesn't flip around and turn his back to him, but with a smile, he basically says, I think you need some healing, don't you? I think you need a little loving, and I'm including that, but I think that's what happened. And he looked at him and he said, Matthew, I'm not here to push you away. I want you to do something. I want you to be healed. And to be healed, what do you have to do? Leave this all behind and come and what? Follow me. Can you imagine what those words must have sounded like to Matthew's ears? You mean there is hope for me? You mean that I thought I had burnt all my bridges and yet you are constructing a bridge to me? You mean that there is a way that I can change my life and get it back? And Jesus is saying, absolutely, because I am the physician, and what you need, I can give you, and I can heal you better than new. And you know what happened? Matthew gave up everything, and he gained everything. And this man, he followed Jesus for the rest of his life, and 
even amongst some of the disciples, I think they had a hard time accepting him for a while, but eventually they did. And he gave his very life for Jesus. But the most important thing was, he was a man who was broken, broken hearted, and Jesus healed him. If Jesus can heal a materialistic, greedy man like Matthew, can he heal us today like that? Yes. There is nobody who is out of Jesus' reach. But if you doubt that, let's look at our second character. A woman named Mary Magdalene. Do you remember anything about Mary? Mary was a woman who, she gets a lot of things laid at her plate that I'm not sure she deserved. But the one thing the Bible does say, Jesus exercised one demon, two demons, three demons. She had a house full of demons, Seven. And people have said that that representative number means seven is that she had a complete household of demons living in her. Now I want you to imagine if Mary Magdalene was your next door neighbor or the lady down the block, what would your experience with her have been like? Now I've got to tell you, I've done some studies on demon possession, and that's not something you really want to be. You don't want to have demons living within your life because they are cruel creatures. And I have no doubt in my mind that what people who saw Mary as she lived in her house, walked down the streets, that she didn't have a good look on her face. And she probably cussed worse than the worst iron worker that you've ever met. No offense to our iron worker friends. Or our sailors, Mark. <laughs> but she probably blasphemed constantly. And the demons probably had her do things with her body that was not good for polite company. Do you know what I mean? In other life, her life was controlled by evil beings. She had no control. And they would have said, this poor lady, the rabbis don't want to deal with her. She's a lost case. She's too far gone. And yet it says in Scripture that Jesus, it doesn't go into a lot of detail, but these things that controlled her, Jesus had passion on her, and he healed her. And when he healed her, I believe within all of my heart that people who saw her after the healing, who knew her before, said, what happened to this lady? Because here's what the Scriptures do teach us. Mary Magdalene not only gave up everything and followed Jesus, but she used her resources to help financially support him. And do you know that she became such a key part of Jesus' ministry that if you count up the number of times her name is mentioned in the Bible, it is greater than the major majority of the apostles? She had an impact in Jesus' ministry. She went from a demon-possessed, substance-controlled individual, and she was turned around to somebody who was with Jesus through thick and thin. Even when the apostles were running, she was right there with him. That didn't happen by accident. That's not what demon-possessed people do. That happens when a person has been healed by the great physician, and has a transformed heart and a transformed life. Is Jesus the great physician, and is there a case that is too lost for Jesus to be able to deal with? Absolutely not. But I'd like you to consider the third individual. And believe it or not, this was the hardest, in my mind, of many of Jesus' healings. And he was the last one that you would have expected, because he was so religious. He was an individual who knew the scriptures. He was passionate about his faith. He was respected. And if you had asked him before Jesus healed him, what's your spiritual condition? I'm the healthiest person or one of the healthiest people in all of Judaism. I'm what you should want to be. I'm proud. And that is the hardest type of person for Jesus to get to is the person who's proud, unteachable, thinks they have all of the answers, thinks that they're healthy when Jesus looks down and says, 
You're sick, and you know who that man's name was? Paul. Paul was the individual who many mothers may have said, I want you to be like Paul. And yet, Paul, thinking that he had it all together, Jesus said, no, you don't. And he had to use some of his most dramatic skills to reach the heart of Saul. The Damascus Road, knocked down, blind, humiliated, being taken to a gent to a home where, where now he has to think and meditate and realize that all of the people he's killed because he thought he was doing it right. Do you know how much harm passionate Christian people who think they're right and who are unteachable, how much harm they sometimes do to the people of God? That was Paul. Paul was passionate. Paul thought he had it all together. Paul thought he was right, and Paul was as wrong as he could be. And he didn't know it. He was blind to it. Mary and Matthew probably understood, we need some help. Paul didn't. And yet he was one of the people who needed it the worst. And yet, when Jesus healed him, his heart was 180 degrees from where it used to be, right? Instead of being the persecutor of the faith, he became the protector and the teacher of the faith. Instead of hating Gentiles and all that, he became the apostle to the Gentile. Did that happen by accident? Or did it happen because the great physician got a hold of him and said, Paul, you're in denial. You need help and I'm going to help you. And when Jesus sets out on a task as the great physician, he accomplishes his purpose. Now, somebody says, Tom, what does this all have to do with me, and where is the relevance for us today? Because this should have relevance for us, correct? Well, let me give it to you. Are you hurt? Are you brokenhearted? Do you wish you could feel some joy again? Do you wish that you could be forgiven or maybe forgive someone else? You know, our sicknesses come in a lot of forms and are all just as devastating. Well, if you want that, if you want your life to be different, if you want to be a different person than you are right now, you've got good news. The doctor's in. And you know the beautiful thing about this physician? He doesn't have set office hours. He's open 24-7. And he doesn't say, I specialize in just this and not that. He specializes in everything, and he's good. He's good. And he wants to heal. And he doesn't check your purse before he checks your pulse. Because he comes with the free gift of salvation. Amen? And so if you are like Matthew and Mary, and you say, I need help, I need to get loose of some things, Jesus has said, see the sign? It says, come right on in. Follow me. I will heal you. Others may turn their back on you, but I will never turn you away and I don't care how far you have fallen. I don't care how much in need you are. I can heal it all if you'll just let me do my work in your heart. Now, if you've already been sick, and if Jesus is in the process of healing you, then I have another message for you. You say, well, he's healing me, because we're never healed completely. Amen. This is called sanctification, we're justified, but that's the start of the healing process. We will not be completely healed until we leave this body and we stand in the presence of Jesus. We are in continued healing, but you've got to start somewhere. But you see, once you realize that Jesus has begun to heal you, you need to do what Matthew and Mary and Paul did. All three of them, after they began to be healed, they said, I can't keep this to myself. I need to share it with others. 
They didn't hold this in for themselves. They began to speak to others about what Jesus had done for them. So I'm going to ask you, if you're a believer this morning, I want you to be more than grateful. I want you to be more than thankful. I want you to become a living testimonial, a living advertisement for others so that we can begin to welcome those who really need help. I'm going to make a statement. I don't mean to be insulting, and I'm sure it's not anybody in here. But you know, sometimes churches get into the habit of we want people to come, but we want the right kind of people to come. Seriously. I've literally had a person in the last year, they're in a church in another town, they said, Tom, it's bothering me because I live in a church and suddenly there are people who are coming to church that I don't have a comfort factor with. They, they have older cars, they don't smell as well, they have some issues, you know, they're broken. And they kind of say, you know, we'd like to get the ones with the, they, they, they're doing well in society, they, they, they come all, that's not what we should do. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke the 8th chapter, verse 39. The man from whom the demons had gone begged him to go with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. Paul went out and told the world, this is what Jesus did for me. Mary Magdalene went out and said, this is what this Jesus did for me. Matthew went out and said, this is what Jesus did for me. And it was not always the cleanest cut people you'd ever meet. In fact, many of these people have messed up by the numbers. But do they deserve a second chance? Do they deserve our love? And Well, they can come here if we need to reach out to all aspects of our community because everybody from the richest to the poorest needs who? Jesus. And so let's end it with this and ask that God would touch hearts this morning. Is there someone here this morning who is hurting, who needs the touch of the physician in their life, who kneels to be healed, who is brokenhearted, who is frustrated, who is out without hope, that's what our Jesus will do for you. And again, if you are a believer, start looking for other people because this is not something that's the best kept secret in the world. It's something we should have out there plain in sight, okay? This morning, we're going to have a prayer and then as we sing this song, I'm going to remain here, and if you need Jesus in any way, the great physician is in. Come to him. Heavenly Father, this morning, this morning, Father, there are people who have needs in so many ways of life. And sometimes it's because of pride or vanity that we say, well, I'll deal with this myself when we need professional help. And I mean professional by you. Father, if there is anyone here this morning who needs the healing hand of Jesus, his loving touch, I ask that you would tap them on the shoulder the way you did Matthew and say, come, follow me. I am here. If there's somebody who is caught by an addiction or a habit or for a lack of forgiveness or needing forgiveness. Father, whatever the need is, let them come forward and seek what you only can give. And Father, for those of us who have experienced your touch, please, please, please let us go beyond just being inwardly grateful and thankful. But let's start telling people boldly this is what Jesus can do for you. In his name we pray. Amen. If you'd like, stand. If you have a need, come. And let's sing this song. Change my heart, oh God. Make me
before God as we get ready. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Praise God. Will everyone stand up for a few minutes and let's just go Amen. out with the joy of the Lord. Amen. I trade in my sorrows. I trade in my shame. I play the down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness, I'm trading my pain, I'm laying them down to the joy of the Lord. We're saying yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. I am pressed but not crunched, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse, for His promise will endure, His joy is going to be my strength. Though the sorrow may last for the night, the joy comes in the morning. I am trading my sorrows. I trade you my shame. I lay them down for the joy of the Lord. I trade you my sadness. I trade you my pain. I lay them down for the joy of the Lord. We're saying yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen.
one of the most frustrating things before we leave that I ever experienced was a person who had a lot of physical problems, and I knew a physician who had helped them. And they just wouldn't go. And I have never to this day figured out why. They'd always say, well, maybe tomorrow, whatever. They would rather suffer than get healed. How many of them are like us? Do you believe that Jesus has the willingness and the ability to heal anything that we are dealing with? any weakness, any addiction, any issue, he does. Now, if you need that, take it with you. If you have it, share it with somebody this week. In Jesus' name.